Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for what you have done through our lives. We thank you so much for answering our prayers. And also, we thank you so much for disciplining us so that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is not only imputed to our heart, but acted out in our life to share resemblance of Jesus Christ in our life, Father. And also, we thank you so much for blessing our EGTD number 13 for our candidates and team members alike, Father. May we continually share this love that you have poured out to every one of us, Father. And this time, we want to open our hearts to receive your word, that we know that your word is a truth and life, and only when we abide in your truth that we can enjoy the freedom and happiness that you want us to fully enjoy. So would you anoint my tongue with your Holy Spirit and help me to speak the words that are only pleasing to you. And we thank you and we honor you in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I have a fan over there. <laughs> um, as we continue on with the spiritual warfare that we want to expose what Satan is and also what his scheme is. And as we continue on, last Friday we talked about how the enemy attacks our life, our heart. Because our heart is the most deceitful thing on the earth. That we think how our heart condition is. But so easily that our heart can be contaminated by sexual lust and also with a covetousness. And then easily puffed up. So the enemy, knowing our weakness of our heart, that he will attack us in the area of sexual lust and also covetousness. Anything that we idol after more than we love God, it becomes an idol. And through the course of the Bible, as we study, God has a tendency to destroy not only our idol, but idolatry as well. So that's why sometimes when we love anything more than we love God, the things we grasp, the things that we hold on to, we end up losing that, but also that we uh, end up breaking our heart as well. And then, alas, we cry out unto the Lord, and we seek after him, and then we, he encounters us, then reveals his truth in our life, and then everything is set in order, because our love for him has to be highest priority, because our God is a jealous God. Then thirdly, because our heart is the most deceitful, so easily we become puffed up. Because anything that we accomplish, we know it's all by the grace of God. Even through the prayer, God answers our prayers. Then we ought to give a true credit and give all glory to God. But we end up saying to our hearts, it was because I prayed. I prayed. This ego of me always kicks in. And then our heart is lifted up and puffed up. And that's how Satan uses it. Because in our mind, in our hearts, trying to elevate ourselves above our God. And then that's how uh, God uh, disciplines us. Because God cannot curse our life. Because his intention is always to bless us. As we have observed last Friday, God's plan is to give us a peaceful life and to bless us. But the enemy knows that God cannot curse us but there are ways to invite wrath of God. And that, knowing that, the enemy will constantly attack our heart with a sexual lust and covetousness and pride. So that's why we need to guard our heart. Above anything else, the issue of life comes out of our heart. So always we need to guard our heart that our heart do not give in to sexual lust and do not covet after anything else, then we love God the most. And also, that always humbling ourselves, because humility is a choice. We decide to abase ourselves. 
we decide to humble ourselves so that in due time, God may exhort us. Humility is a choice. It's just like a love is a choice as well. So we decide to humble ourselves so that in due time, God may exhort us as well. So we need to understand to guard our hearts how Satan attacks our heart in these areas because he knows God cannot curse us. But he knows when our heart becomes corrupted with a lust, with a covetousness, with a pride, then we invite wrath of God because that's tactic of the Satan. So we want to examine and also always put a guard upon our hearts. Now, today we want to continue on the tactics the enemy uses to invite the wrath of God is that he tried to put in our minds lies. So he not only attacks our heart, but also he attacks our mind. And then he manipulates our emotion so that we don't do the will of God. So let me repeat that. Two areas that we want to look at tonight is that how Satan attacks our mind or our thoughts. And also he manipulates our emotion so that we don't end up doing the will of God. So let's look at uh, first 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. And let us read this. For the weapons of our warfare are not corner, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our spiritual warfare is not in the domain of physical realm. Our spiritual warfare does not belong in the flesh or blood, but it's in the spiritual realm. But we need to be careful by, because in our thoughts, Satan brings certain thoughts into our mind and elevate ourselves. So constantly we need to train ourselves and discipline ourselves to bring every thought into obedience of our Christ, obedience to his word. Now, oftentimes, as a Christian, as, as any person, every thought I have, we think it is mine. It is mine. It's my thought. It's my idea. Whatever I think in my mind, this is mine. But we need to understand where is this thought coming from? Because every thought that occurred in my mind, they are not mine. It's a given by someone. It's a given by someone. My thought can be given by God directly by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the unction of Holy Spirit. That thought may come from God with a godly thought, something to obey. Holy Spirit may remind me certain verse in particular situation, beating me to obey, to lead a powerful life. And then that thought is from the Holy Spirit, from God directly. However, every thought that occurs in my mind, they are not all the time from God. We must understand the sources of our thoughts. So be able to discern and differentiate whether they are from God. Because oftentimes my thoughts will come from the world, from the media, from the sound that I listen to, from television, from radio, even from the people. Whatever they say. And because of what I hear and what I see, a thought can be formulated, but that is most likely it's not godly. It's from the word. And we must be able to discern that. And also there's a thought coming from my own flesh. When I get hungry during my fast, and a thought may come to me. Let me cut it short. Because when we prepare Threstias or short-term mission, I challenge our people to do engage into 24-hour long fast. And I may have a one hour left. And that moment, 
a thought might occur because of my weakness in my flesh. I'm hungry. You know, I don't need to be too legalistic. Let me just shorten it. I can eat by 8 p.m. Thursday evening, but I'm meeting someone. So let me cut it short to 7 p.m. because I don't want to, you know, show up myself as a holy person. That thought, where is it coming from? Is it from God? Is it from God? Because I don't need to be legalistic. Really? Is it really from God? Or is it the enemy using my weakness in my flesh and through my mind a thought comes and I violate that and I have done so before and I end up eating an hour earlier then immediately Satan comes to me with a condemnation. Condemnation. You violated it. You didn't keep, you only end up doing it 23 hours. And then God's not going to fully answer your prayers. And there's a condemnation coming to me in my thoughts. That's directly from the enemy. And I need to wrestle with it. And immediately I repent. I was deceived and I gave in to temptation. I repent God. And then afterwards, I will use the name of Jesus and diffuse and cast out all the condemning and accusing voice in my mind. So we need to be able to discern the thoughts occurring in our mind because they are not all from God. And when we grab every thought as a mind, if it is God from God, through obedience, it produces godly and righteous fruit in our life. But if it is from devil directly, and when I grab it, thinking this is my own, and I live with it, obey it, then I become slave to Satan's tactic, then I receive and I bear corruption in my life. So we must be able to differentiate that every thought occurs in my mind. Because sometimes people may think, oh, this is a brilliant idea, and I think I'm smart. But indeed, that thought may not be from God. And it can be destructive as I try to do the will of God or minister God and his people. So that's why I need to be very, very discerning and be able to discern every thought that occurs in my mind. Why even psychologists say that every day, each person approximately, they have about more than 10,000 thoughts occur each day. Oh, I'm hungry. Why, why does she have that kind of hairstyle? Why does he talk like that? So many thoughts constantly occurring in our mind. But are they all from God? But are they all from me? Is that from my intelligence? Is that from me? Or is that from enemy? Because the Bible is very clear. The enemy gave a thought to the people even who followed Jesus Christ. For example, Peter. Peter prompted by the Holy Spirit. Who do they say that I am? You are true living son of God. Blessed are you, Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. And he was a completely manager by Lord Jesus Christ. Why? That thought, realization came from God. Because it was not by flesh and blood that you were able to know this but it was from God that thought realization understanding came from God but immediately soon after when Jesus predicted his crucifixion and persecution and trial on the cross and hated by chief priests and then Peter will grab him and set him aside no Lord never then what did Jesus say to Peter get behind me you Satan because at that moment his mind was full of thoughts from the enemy, from Satan himself. And that's why Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. How is it possible? Same vessel, same mind can be filled with the thoughts of God and also contaminated by the enemy. And we need to be able to discern that. Because every thought, again, is not from God. It can be from enemy. So that's why in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 23, get behind me, Satan. And he was rebuked by Jesus Christ. Now here, the mind, because you do not think, you do not mind, 
here King James Version because even our computer doesn't have any other translation. He says, for thou savest not the things that be of God. Here in original language is a phroneo. Phroneo is a, to think or to mind. Because you don't mind, you don't think things be of God, but things that are men. And another example, another example is Judas Iscariot. Because in his mind, a thought came from the enemy. In his heart, Satan gave him a thought to betray Jesus Christ. It's very, very clear. So what happens is, here in the book of Luke, I'm sorry, let's look at book of John chapter 13, verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Bible is very clear. It was a devil who gave a thought into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Now Judas Iscariot, when this thought came to his heart or mind, he grabbed it. I will betray Jesus. I will betray Jesus. As he dwelt on this thought continually, and Bible is very clear in book of Luke chapter 22 and also in the book of John chapter 13, verse 27, it says, now after sob, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, thou sh can, yeah, 13, 27. After sob, Satan entered into him. In verse 2, it said, Satan gave a thought into his heart to betray Jesus. Now as uh, Judas Iscariot continually dwelled on the thought of betraying Jesus, after a certain time, Satan himself entered inside Judas Iscariot. And also under Luke chapter 22, verse 3, again, then entered Satan into Judas Salmon's surname Iscariot, being the number of the twelve. So there seems to be, from the Bible, the process. A thought is given from the devil himself to betray Jesus. And as a dress is carried, grab that thought and dwelt in it for certain duration. Satan himself, that dwelling in that thought, opened the channel, opened the door, inviting Satan himself inside Judas Iscariot, and Satan working together with him ended up selling Jesus himself. That's why not only from last Friday, we need to guard our heart, but also we need to discipline ourselves, filtering our thoughts with the truth, truth of Jesus Christ. Where is this thinking coming from? I hate that person. I despise this person. And we justify our unforgiveness in our mind and curse at him and criticize and condemn and bring gossips. And how did this thought initiate it? Is it from God or is it from devil? Is it from my flesh? Is it devil walking through the tunnel of the world or from my flesh? These thoughts coming into my mind. And when I dwell in these thoughts and I obey them, then in my life that I will bear continually fruits of corruption, unrighteousness, and destructive behaviors in our lives. But that's exactly what the enemy wants. Remember, the thought saying, Lord, no, Lord, never, never. Peter, as Peter said, Peter was a believer of Jesus Christ. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't, don't we never be naive thinking that my mind is so pure, so purified because I believe in Jesus and I follow Jesus Christ just because I, I pray, just because I read the Bible, that my mind is all protected from the thoughts from the enemy. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Constantly, constantly, we need to discipline ourselves, examine our thoughts. Where is this thinking coming from? Is it from God? Is it from the enemy? Is it contaminated by the worldly media? Or is it from my flesh? And be able to discern that and grab it and cast it out and run to God and fill my mind 
because our mind can be renewed by the word of God. And we need to understand our mind can be vulnerable. And second way, another way that, that the enemy can deceive us or manipulate us is that our emotion. Our emotion. Our emotion can be so fluctuating. This is one of the greatest hindrances for us to obey God's word. Because I mentioned previously multiple times in the Bible, I will, when God said, I will help you, I will do this, and you shall do this. The will, the language, the vocabulary, and King James Version, how many times I mentioned about will? Because in our soulless realm, there is intelligence, will, and emotion. And how many times God's words are mentioned with a W-I-L-L? 3,837 times from the Bible. But how many times does it record the feel, F-E-E-L, from the Bible? Only seven times. Only seven times versus 3,800 3, times, more than 3,800 times of will versus feel only seven times from entire Bible. Why? Because God has given us a free will and all word, every single word from God is about imploring our will, not our emotion. Rejoice always. How is it possible relying upon my emotion that I can rejoice in the Lord always? Impossible unless I decide to rejoice in the Lord. Because every command from God is imploring to our will not to our emotion. But the enemy knows that. Enemy knows that. But the emotion is real. It's not truth. Emotion changes, so it's not truth. Because if, if anything to be truthful, it has to be unchanging eternally. Word of God is unchanging. Word of God is unchanging. Flower will fade. Everything will pass away in the world, but the word of God abides forever. The Bible declares. So the word of God is truth, but our emotion is not truth because it fluctuates. It changes. It changes. Look at the children. I only have four children in my house. These are children. One of the signs of immaturity is that person is moved by emotion and fluctuates. My children can be happiest children in the earth and in five minutes they can turn back to saddest children in the whole world. In all, it only takes five minutes. Depends upon what they like to do. When I say no, they become saddest. When I say yes, then they get excited and become happiest of the children. They are fluctuated by their emotion. Their heart condition is dominated by the emotion. And when we say he or she is an immature Christian, that's the same way. Instead of being led by the Spirit, instead of being led by the Word of God, they're being led by the, their emotion. And the enemy knows that. Enemy knows the Word of God is given to our will and for our will to make a decision to say yes or no to his word. So what the enemy does is because the feeling is real and he comes in and grabs our emotion and he manipulates it. Why? Because God says, rejoice always. Give a thanks in everything. How? I don't feel like it. In this circumstance, how is it possible that I need to give, I can give thanks to God? How can I forgive that person when I'm emotionally so wounded and I feel so sad and so hurt? How can I forgive that brother? So that the enemy wants us to focus on our emotion and drag us away, pulling away from the word of God, pulling away from the truth. That's what it does. So if we want to be mature and become spiritual giant and victorious in the spiritual warfare, that we must be able to discern if this is my emotion or I am with a free will God has given me, obey God's word. When I decide to obey God's word, 
then the spirit comes in, kicks in, and helps me to enable to obey in his word. But when I'm dragged by the emotion and justify the reasons why I cannot obey God's word, then I'm led by the emotion and continually be dragged and manipulated by the devil. And my disobedience can be perpetual for years. Years and we became captivity, captives and fugitives of our own emotion. And behind our emotion, there's an enemy. There's an enemy. Because of time, let me talk about three areas of how Christians are deceived by emotion. First is giving thanks to our God. As we talked about giving thanks to our God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and through 18, he says, Rejoice evermore. Rejo pray without ceasing. And give, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And when we hear this, how is it possible to rejoice evermore? And how is it possible to pray without ceasing? And how is it possible in everything, give thanks? When I get into car accidents, when someone curses me and I have to give a thanks to the Lord, when I'm hurt by the remarks of other brothers and sisters and I give a thanks, and when someone betrays me and when I'm down and when I'm laid up and got fired and I need to give a thanks to the Lord, yes, in everything, he commands, in everything, give thanks to the Lord. But there, my emotion is far away from what I'm trying to do in obedience to God's word. And there, the enemy kicks in. That's not how you feel. You're miserable. You, you are pathetic. You're so discouraged. You're so down. You're so depressed. Dwell in your emotion. And you have a right to dwell in your emotion. And that's the enemy's thought coming to me and putting me in this peak. But God says... Trust me. I am your good God. I love you. I know what you need. And I can give you the best. And I can create a beauty out of the ashes. Trust me. Give thanks in everything. You come to me. Come to me. Diffuse your emotion. And just come to me and obey. And give thanks. Try it. Even though you don't feel like it. You don't feel like it. The relationship between our emotion and our will is that some people give us an illustration saying that our will is the engine part of a train and that our emotion is the cabins. So however the engine runs and goes to the left and to the right and naturally our emotion will follow according to how we make a decision in our will. And I myself gave this illustration. The emotion is like a stream of water. It tends to flow whichever he wants to go. That's our emotion. If let it loose, then it will go anywhere. Angry, sad, joyful, however it wants to flow. But the wheel is like a stone or rocks that we can put on the side. If we want our emotion turned to the left, then we put a stone there. And we'll make a curve and go to the left. And if we want to have this emotion turn to the right, then we put a stone to the right. And it will curve to the right. That's the relationship between our will and our emotion. Now, when we do not understand this and give in and live by the emotion, we don't realize how detrimental our life can be. Now, we, meant, we talked about giving thanks in everything, trusting God, and decide to rejoice. Then second domain is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. The Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, here he said, 6, 14, and 15, if you forgive men their trespasses and your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now, for me, 
this is the greatest warning that I can find from New Testament. If I don't forgive my brothers and sisters, all the sins that I commit, God will not forgive me. That means my relationship, my fellowship with God, intimacy will be removed and will be blocked. My prayer will be hindered. That's a severest warning from New Testament. And the enemy knows it. Enemy knows it. So what is his weapon? Our emotion. Typically, the reason why we cannot forgive the brother and sister is because my emotion is hurt. So as long as I dwell in the wounded soul, wounded emotion, and I go for it, then I cannot forgive that person. I cannot forgive that person. Emotion is so real at the time, and I'm hurt. I'm bitter at that person. How is it possible that I forgive that person? The Bible declares, forgive. So in a way, when we ask God, God, help me to forgive, that's a wrong prayer. Help me to forgive that brother or sister is a wrong for prayer because God already declared forgive. And what we do is using our will and decide to forgive that person. And we say and verbalize it because in our mouth confession, there's authority, there's a power, even though I don't feel like it. And my feeling is far away from what I'm saying. And I feel like I'm hypocritical, but I still do it with my will. And that's obedience before God. Because God never said, if you feel like it, obey. If you feel like it, forgive. No, absolutely not. There's no condition of our emotion. He said, forgive. And we forgive. So many times, even though I don't feel like it, but once I speak it in my prayer, I forgive him. I forgive her for what she has said and what he has done. And then there comes the freedom. And because I am being obedient to God, then God is on my side. And with my obedience, God's healing hands come into my emotion and he begins to heal my emotion. But the obedience comes first with my will. And as much as you go through inner healing process or all kinds of retreat, everything, but if you do not make a decision to forgive that person, healing will never come. Healing will not come. And we can dwell in that condition, in that bitterness, in that unforgiveness for years. And I've been saying that. And when we dwell in that unforgiveness, we invite we open the door for enemy to come in and mess our life up. Remember, the enemy is a king of lies. He's a father of lies and he comes only to destroy, steal, and to kill. And that's exactly what happens. Even demonizations, and we're going to talk about it next Friday. Can Christian be demonized? And that's a big question. And we're going to talk about it. And out of experience, so many times, so many times, they become so vulnerable to demonic oppression and attacks because of unforgiveness. And when I counsel them and invite them to forgive and verbalize it, and then we pray and leave. And in, sometimes we literally see God's blessing coming in and flowing into that person's life in the matter of days. In the matter of days. So we need to understand enemy is a tactic. Enemy is a tactic because he manipulates our emotion, our feeling. But when I forgive a person, the greatest accusation from enemies, because I don't feel like it, he says, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You don't feel like it, but you say it. You say it. But it is my will, and I must know it, it is my will and I'm obeying his word whether I feel like it or not and I'm doing it God and God is seeing it and God is hearing my decision and it brings me the freedom so many times so many times I have experienced it so many times so first area of our emotion the Satan attacks is giving thanks to the Lord in every occasion. Second is unforgiveness. And third is in the area of love. Love is not an emotion. Nowhere in the Bible it declares love is an emotion. 
No, absolutely not. Let's revisit book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, our love chapter. Let's look at book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 7. Now, King James Version, it says a charity because they wanted a friendship between romantic love to agape love. But that's just something, one of the things I don't like about King James Version. But uh, it says a charity, but it's love, agape love. Charity, love suffers long and it's kind and love envies not. Love vaunts not itself and is not puffed up and does not behave himself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. When we read what love is, where does it say anything that is uh, emotional? No. Mostly, it's about our character. It's about our will. It's about our choice. Love long suffers. It says even suffering. Originally, it means love suffers long. Being patient is a suffocating sometimes. Being patient with an unlovable person of his habit always intimidating you, irritating you, and you need to live together with a your husband or your wife, that's sometimes tormenting. It takes a patience. Pastor John Piper said, staying in marriage does not necessarily mean staying in love, romantic love. No, it's not. Love requires a commitment and requirement at its will. But the enemy comes and beautifies love as an emotional fling. And that's what words description is. Love, the word love, is the most crooked and messed up description that we have in this world. And Christians also are influenced by that wrong description. Because we think that's a romance. No, absolutely not. If romance it's a true love and it's a base and prerequisite of our marriage that no one will stay in the marriage after three years. I guarantee you. We may begin relationship with a romance, with a man and woman, but naturally it requires a commitment and responsibility because love may be initiated by romance, but it has to grow in certain stage of your married life, transform into agape love. Otherwise, you will never be able to maintain your marriage. That's why brothers and sisters, they get so confused. After marrying into third year, fourth year, emotion is gone and I'm out of love. No, love is not in and out hamburger. Once you are eat, you are committed and it goes a lifetime until that sets you apart. That's what love is. Even though you don't feel like it, you honor your parent. You honor your wife. Even though you don't feel like it, you serve your spouse. That's a love. Even though you don't feel like waking up 3 a.m. to feed your baby, you still do it against your emotion. That's a love. But the enemy comes and deceives us in the area of loving. Even when we try to love our brothers and sisters and we base upon our emotion, I don't feel like loving that brother and I have a hard time saying it because there's no emotion. That's a lie. So we are stuck in that emotion and we don't approach and we don't proceed further. And we condemn ourselves. I don't love. I don't have a love. When the Bible declares, by the Holy Spirit, love of God has been fully shared in your heart. All you need to do is, by your will, by your choosing, by your choice, you open the facet and let the love of God flow out into the hearts of the people. But the enemy comes and messes us up because of how I feel that moment. How I feel that moment. Because if God's greatest commandment is to love our God, 
And Jesus gave us a new commandment is to love one another as I have loved you. So unless we master and we fully understand and differentiate between emotion and true love, then we cannot obey his greatest command. Because it's all about love. And love is not emotion. Love is not emotion. Even during our EGTD number 13, team members, when they set up the chairs and prepare deco, refreshment, all these, they were only able to sleep two hours or three hours. Physically, they're exhausted. Emotionally, they're drained, but they still do it. Why? Because they love God, because they love candidates. That's love. If they serve according to how they feel, Threshdias will become so chaotic. Will become so chaotic. That's a deception from the enemy. That's a deception from the enemy. When we decide to love and embrace and forgive unlovable, someone that does not deserve grace from us, and we choose to love, and then we truly act in the grace of our God. As someone mentioned, because that's how he loved me. Because I'm the unlovable. Because I'm the unlovable. I don't deserve his grace. I don't deserve his love. But he's been patient with me until today. And he will be patient with me forever. And he decided to love me. And his love is unaltering. Unchanging. Whether he feels like it or not. I know I grieve him. I know I sadden him. I know I frustrate him. I know I upset him. But I know his love for me never changes. That's a love. Because love is not emotion. But I believe Satan damaged in the area, scope of love, both in the world and inside the church, the greatest way. And we are all lost so many times. So let's remember ourselves. The enemy attacks us through our hearts and through our thoughts and then through our emotion. And as a Christians, that we must be able to filter these things out and be able to distinguish the difference between the truth and non-truth. And avoid non-truth and hold and grasp truth and move on. And then we become victorious Christians, and as we exercise and discipline ourselves, we'll become spiritual giants, engaging into spiritual warfare. After victory, it comes the spoils. After war, we win the war, there's always spoils that we can enjoy. When we overcome obstacles, when we overcome and win the battle, there are spoils that we can enjoy. Let us all rise. Let us pray. Let us examine our mind, our thoughts. What kind of thoughts have we been dwelling recent days? Are they from God or are they from enemy? Or are they from my weak flesh? Even non-believers, their minds were darkened by the spirit of this world. So that's why when we evangelize, that we need to fight in the name of Jesus and ask God to remove a veil from their heart. And sometimes the thoughts that are given by the enemy, we dwell in it and we build a stronghold in our life. And it creates a veil and we become spiritually numb and blinded. Let's uh, discern those thoughts and reject and pull out and invite the truth of Jesus Christ into our mind to renew our mind constantly. And then let's look at our emotion. The reason why I cannot give a thanks to the Lord is because I tend to be led by the emotion. What areas I cannot give a thanks to the Lord? Is that because someone said bad things about me? Talked about me behind my back? Someone deserted me? Someone doesn't like me, that I cannot give thanks. Or in what areas, with what people can I not 
forgive. I need to forgive that person. To set myself free. That my prayer may not be hindered. And thirdly, love. Am I being enslaved by my emotion and hinders me to love the brothers and sisters? Let's ask God and let's decide. Let's verbalize it. Knowing God's word, let's give a thanks to the Lord. Let's forgive. I forgive this brother. I forgive this sister. I forgive this him and her. And I decide to love him and her. So let's pray. Let's call on the name of Jesus three times and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you.